Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're having a little bit of fun here in studio today. I'm, I'm with a really good friend of mine who we're going to be talking about something that uh, really piqued my curiosity, piqued my interest when I first heard the concept. And I think you're really going to enjoy it. Now, a lot of business owners, and even if you're not really a business owner yet, or you're thinking about becoming a business owner, uh, our topic today is going to be one about those kinds of relationships that we all have. And uh, sometimes we call them difficult people. People are sometimes not that fun to work with. Uh, but we're going to be talking about that today and how to deal with them and how to give you some strategies maybe to make your life a little bit more pleasant around these people. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Roberta Shaler, and she's the author of 16 books, if you can believe it. Uh, PhD in psychology. She's very, very, very well read. And not only that, she's traveled the world speaking and talking about this topic. And she's coined the phrase hijackle, and we're going to find out a lot more about that. So with further, without further ado, let me bring on my guest here, and we'll have a great conversation today. Roberta, thank you for being here. Oh, thanks so much. It's always great to talk with you. This is fun. Yeah, you know, we, fun. We, You and I were sitting in, in studio before, and we were having this conversation, and we are talking about all these, these topics. I'm thinking about the audience that is primarily uh, targeted for, for this particular program are business owners, but they could be employees, they could be in relationships, and what we're talking about here really applies to them across the board, doesn't it? Absolutely, because no matter which of those things you're interacting with, you're always interacting with people. It's a relationship. That's right. <laughs> no matter what, you so, can't get away from it. It's a relationship. No, you can't. <laughs> I mean, you, you might be able to live in some remote cabin somewhere and maybe be subsisting, but the rest of the time you're going to be in a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I want to get started. Um, I guess the, the best way to start off this thing is you've coined the phrase hijackal. And I'd like to maybe start off right there and we'll say, let's start with like a definition of what a hijackal is. Where sure. does it come from? Who are these people? And uh, where do we run into them in our lives? Wow, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let me tell you first why I coined the phrase. There are people who are momentarily difficult in our lives. There's somebody having a bad day, they're going through a bad patch, maybe they're in grief or they're in loss or they're in overwhelm. But then there are this other group of people called chronically difficult people. And these are the people that you have difficulty with over and over and over, and you know other people have difficulty with them too, and those difficulties have similarities. And so you, become, you become very, very aware that there's a difference between a momentarily difficult person and a chronically difficult person. So knowing that, I thought, how can we talk about this without getting clinical, without getting into any way that we are uh, putting people into categories and dismissing them or feeling superior to them by giving them psychological labels. So there's a bunch of traits, a pool of traits from which hijackals drink. <laughs> And in that pool of traits, we find the hijackal behaviors. So what hijackals are, are people who hijack relationships for their own purposes while relentlessly scavenging them for power, status, and control. We run into these people all the time in our, our everyday lives. I mean, I've worked for people like that. I know exactly what you're talking about. Sure. And, you know, I think... Um, not only in, in the business community, because that's primarily where, where we tend to be focused more than anything, but uh, certainly in intimate relationships, this can happen as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And you could be the child of one. You could have been raised by one. And if that happened to you, you're blissfully unaware that that happened to you. So you learn to cope in the best way that you could. You know, we're born with very undeveloped brains compared to how we are by the time we're 25. So when we're little and we don't have language, what we're trying to do is to keep the giants feeding us and, and <laughs> keeping us alive. I like that analogy. Right? <laughs> you know? So pretty much we're, we're born people pleasers because I need you to eat. I need you to like me. I need you not to leave me behind. I need you to feed me. And so we learn how to do those things. And if we have hijackal parents, this is becoming normal to us that to be with somebody who's chronically difficult, I'm learning and I have in my brain things called mirror neurons. So long before language, I'm beginning to mirror back everything that's happening to me and what I'm learning. And it's becoming imprinted and impacted on me. So if you're raised okay, by there, a hijackal... There's, I'm going to stop you right there because there's a, there's a concept that I think is just amazing. I, I always wondered about that. It's like we do. We mirror our parents at the first example of adult that we have and we start to mirror them. So it's actually neurological. It's not just behavioral. 
it's actually we're rewiring the brain that way. Yeah, we are. We're taking wow. that in with our mirror neurons, and we're saying, all right, this is the way you do it. This is the way you you put food in your mouth. This is the way you stand. Haven't you had that experience or heard of parents having that experience? Their child stands up for the first time, and someone goes, wow, look at that. They're standing just like their dad. Or, oh, look at that facial expression. It's just like the mom. Well, that's mirror neurons. Wow. That's what you do. Oh, they practice, you know, and they get it. <laughs> and so that happens on a psychological basis, too. Like, this is how you respond to things. This is the tone of voice you use. This is when you make eye contact. This is when you don't make eye contact. All of that stuff is being put in there before we have language. So if you had a hijackal parent, which I did, I had a severely hijackal mother and an extremely passive-aggressive father. So that becomes normal to you. And that's why when I say who my clients are, I work with the partners, the exes, and the adult children, as well as the coworkers of chronically difficult people. Because you don't know that happened to you. It's just normal. That, that was life. This is how you do it. This is how you keep the giants happy. This, this is... You this, gotta keep the food coming, right? That's, that's, right. that's the game, is I gotta <laughs> keep right. getting fed. I yeah. gotta have them take care of me, keep a roof over my head, and it becomes... Yeah, that's the, you're, you're people pleasing. I mean, you learn from an early age how to well, do that. Well, you do because we're not like cows and sheep or, and goats and things. We don't get spit out of our mothers, licked off, <clears> and then we leap up and run around the meadow. We know we're a blob. I can't, can't go anywhere. I can't get anything. I can't do anything for myself. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can make is, is noises. <laughs> right? <laughs> and sometimes that's not enough. We've got to get louder, right? That's right. And so, you know, if you think about uh, the development of, <clears throat> of that, it makes sense that if we're mirroring what's happening to us in order to get our basic needs met and survive, that we learn those patterns. And if they're dysfunctional and everything that's being shown to us is dysfunctional, then that's what we mimic. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about this in my own life. It's like, yeah, I can see that. It's like you, you really become your parents, especially as you get older, it seems. You have more and more of those, those traits. And especially you become your parents at your worst moments. Oh, because, that's something I didn't know. Because when you get into an elevated flight or fight state, uh -huh. maybe even anger, arousal, then you're not thinking clearly, so you're not making the adjustments that you perhaps know to do in order to not be like the things about your parents you hated. <laughs> and so <laughs> they pop out, and oh, then you wow. go, oh, no, you no. know, I sound like my mother. I do. Right? <laughs> so, so it's very integral for us to understand that we come by these. We're not, we don't set out in life to behave like this. We're set up for it. And we find these people... Um, I guess from my perspective, I see them in, in business, I run into them, I've worked for them, and, and so on and so forth. They can be a real challenge. <laughs> yes, they usually are a real challenge. Tell me, tell me more about that, because I think oh, I, want, I really want people to get the feeling that they really understand the hijackal personality type sure. when they can see it in their own life. Well, let me tell you something about when you first meet a hijackal, so we okay. get some sort of perspective mm -hmm. on this, Robert. When you first meet a hijackal, what they have is this incredible ability to read you. And I call that radar, hijackal radar, right? <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so they have hijackal radar, and uh, what I do is I teach people how to have radar, hijackal radar, because you've got to know what to see. But they have it, and they search you out. They know, and then they turn on their, their charm and their ability to read you and become the chameleon that meets your needs. So not long ago I was doing video with Ariel Ford and we were talking about soulmates. Oh, it happens so frequently in interpersonal relationships in the romantic world because the, the hijackal meets you and they're sensing and scoping you out and they, oh, she would really like this or this would make her really happy and you know, it's like like the the spider it's, it's beckoning really, the fly the well, whole way into right? the wet. Yes, it's the best way to call it's it is seduction. Seduction, manipulation, yeah. and exploitation. Okay, there you go. You've right? got it nailed. And so they they're they're pulling you into the web, and you think, oh, I've died and gone to heaven. This person is so perfect for me. They know my every need. They anticipate my need. Oh, this is wonderful. And slowly they pull you in, 
and it's a long game, so they're willing to, to do whatever it takes. Then you see a little break and you see, oh, I didn't like that very much. And that's what I call incredulity hits, you know. They do something and you're, it's jaw-dropping to you and you go, oh, who does that? How? I don't believe that. So what do you do? You make up a story to cover it up. You justify and rationalize the behavior. Oh, he's having a bad day. You know, oh, she's, she's concerned about work or whatever. And you stop seeing it as a pattern. You just see it as isolated events that you can rationalize and justify. So you don't, you don't link the, the events together. You know, no. You're not smart enough to really, at that point, put the two and two together. You're just saying, that was a one-off event and don't pay attention to That's it. Right. Someone's having a bad day or, you know, he was stressed out or she was stressed out that day. Yeah, well, yeah. We're, we're, we're told, you know, to make exceptions for people. Not everybody's having a great day at right, every moment, every time, right? Right, every time, yeah. So well, except us. Well, of course, but then, you know, <laughs> what can you do with perfection, right? That's right. <laughs> but, but, you know, so we make these exceptions, we make allowances for people, and then we also go to the trouble of making up rationalizations and justifications for their behavior. And so eventually we get to the place where we, we commit to, to a hijackal. We either commit to work for them or we commit to work with them or we commit to be in relationship with them, move in with them, marry them, do whatever. And then once that big gotcha has happened, every day will be a gotcha thereafter. <laughs> well, the big gotcha is the contract signed. That's right. Right? Theoretically. That's right. I mean, it's and whether I, it's a handshake or whether it's a marriage, you know, commitment, it's it's the contract's made and it's done, and yeah. they don't have to they don't have to play anymore. And the hijack goes, done, done. Got now it. I own you. Yeah, yeah. Now padlock sealed. Uh, you know, paddock sealed. We're good. You're in the corral. All right. So now, what am I going to do with you? I'm going to slowly marginalize you. I'm going to slowly tell you you're not good enough. That you don't do things well. So here's a few hijackal hallmarks, if you will. One thing, you always have to have your, red, your radar on for the red flag of someone who always has to win in the moment. Meaning, and we see this in politics often, one day, particularly right now, uh, one you, day... You promised you weren't going to bring politics into this conversation. I didn't. Okay, it was just good. a quick aside. <laughs> um, one day, in order to win in one moment, I have <clears> to say white is black. An hour later, in order to win in the conversation, I have to say white is red. Some bright spark says to me, you just said it was uh, black a minute ago. Oh, no, I didn't. You misunderstood what I said. It's absolutely red. Okay? Absolutely unwilling to note and take responsibility for the fact I just changed completely my opinion. It's your fault. So the first thing is that they have to win in the moment. They will say whatever they have to say to win in the moment, to be right, to be justified, to, to be okay. Now, let me say something in their, in their defense. When you have become a hijackal, you have been normalized to realize you have to be hypervigilant about everything. So what they do is they develop two fences that are running all the time in front of their very fragile, believe it or not, very fragile egos. So they're running these two fences, offense, defense, offense, defense. I'll do whatever I need to do to not let you through to see my actual self, and therefore I would shatter if you got through there. So they're hypervigilant. They're, they're never at ease. They're never at peace, even though they look slick. Internally, they're never at ease. So this is what's going on for the hijackal. So they have to win because I can't be wrong because I would shatter, right? So therefore, it becomes a game of survival. I think is what it, you're really saying. It is saying. a game For of them, psychological survive. survival. Yeah, absolutely, emotional survival. So, so that's their defense mechanism. So in in the the other yeah. side of having to win is that therefore you always are wrong. You will always be blamed. You have it to is lose. always yeah. your fault. <laughs> it doesn't matter <laughs> what it is. It will be your fault somehow, right? So that's a big deal. Then because of the having to win and having to blame, we get something else, which is black or white thinking, all or nothing thinking. So when you're doing what I want you to do, Robert, I can't believe how lucky I am to be in a relationship with you. You are the most wonderful business partner in the world. I, it's wonderful. 
And then all of a sudden, it's so kind of you to say so. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Isn't it? It's just a partnership made in heaven. Yeah. And then you say something to me that I don't like. And as it strikes me, I say, I cannot believe that you would speak to me like that. You don't even deserve to be in business. Now we've gone 180. Complete 180. Yeah, it's, a com yeah, it's completely the other side of the, the complete. The coin. Yeah. Yeah. So one minute you're the best thing since sliced bread. You do something that they don't like. Now you are the scourge of the earth. You should be obliterated from the planet. There are no gray areas for a hijackal. It's Black here or yep. it's here, mm -hmm. right? So you're beginning to see some patterns that these people are living in abject fear, and they could never ever admit that they're living in abject fear. Because they are certain. They are right. They are on it. They have it together. And you are nothing. <laughs> you are my prey. In fact, one of the, in the metaphors that I use for these people is they believe they're the master puppeteers. They're pulling all the strings, and this string doesn't know what this string's doing. Of course, they couldn't possibly know because I'm the brilliant one up here pulling the strings. Mm. Right? So that's where the manipulation so, comes from. And at the from. same time, they can't live without the rest of the people. They need those no, they people. Because the on their own, they're nothing. That's right. They, they have to yeah. be fed. They have to be you fed. Know, yeah. it's, it's, it's little shop of horrors. Feed me, Audrey. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like, I got to have that, right? So it's a very fearful situation. And it's a frightening situation for a, a hijackal because what if I don't get fed? What if somebody won't do what I want, so I just keep getting more and more forceful? And it's a fearful situation for the hijackal fodder, or what I call hijackal bait. Now, if you're like me, Robert, you were, and I was raised by a, a very severely hijackal mom, um, that's what I knew, right? That, that's what I know. So my mirror neurons firing that way. I don't like her, but I don't know any different. And you grow up and you're like, I really don't like this. And I think my mom is nuts. Well, in fact, my mother was in a mental institution. So I knew that there were problems that she had that were beyond my, my comprehension as a young child. But <clears throat> it never felt right. It always felt wrong. But because of the mirror neurons that were in there when I was young, I am exacerbating these behaviors in other people. So I have become hijackal bait. So I grow up, and, and what am I? Well, fortunately, because I was bright and talented, I am bringing kudos to the family by winning prizes and singing and playing the piano all over the place. So my parents are happy, happy. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're happy because they're, they're getting their, <clears throat> their hijackal high fives all over the place. <laughs> and I could provide that, but think of the child who can't. Think of the child who doesn't have those things to give that would be ego gratifying for the hijackal parent. So I, I'm in that setup. This is why I can help people so effectively because I was an only child getting severe hijackal, extreme passive aggression. <laughs> Both at the same time. Both at the same time. Yeah. So I had to work through all of that and I know what it took. And I know what it takes because you always then have to realize it's part of your, your makeup. And even though you've made different choices and you have different perceptions, you still get the feeling every now and again. Yeah. 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 So, um, boy, my mind is just spinning with ideas here. Because you see these, these personalities that I'm thinking, okay, I know one, I know two. Yeah, that one is probably that. Right, I think other people are probably doing that too, watching this. And they're going, yeah. yeah, I know some people like that. And, and they're also <clears> thinking, oh, I thought it was me. Oh, it's that person who behaves like that, and I have the feeling that I'm causing it. Well, we get into the habit of trying to please them, and yeah. it becomes an unending treadmill. Well, that's the idea. Because there's nothing that you can do that's ever really going to please them, yeah. ever going to be happy with it. There's always going to be something more that you could, you know, or they expect you to do for them. And there's no point that you get that satisfaction. That's right. Yeah. You know, often when I'm working with couples, Robert, I'll draw the Tao symbol, you know, the thing that we think of as, um, you know, the Tao symbol with the, the black and white and the yin and the yang. Mm -hmm. We think about it that way. And that's a perfect example of what a healthy relationship is. You've got the black and the white, and you've got the white within the black and the black within the white, and it's perfectly balanced. But what happens in a hijackal relationship 
is that middle line keeps moving over to the outside edge, marginalizing, marginalizing, marginalizing one. And the, you know, when I'm working with helpful, yeah. when I'm working with people who are are divorcing a hijacker, I'm always telling them, don't make concessions. Don't make concessions. Don't put this in your divorce agreement. Don't go say this at court, because the non hijackal person says. Oh, well, I just want to be fair. I just want to let them have this. So maybe if I give them this, they will stop. No, they're going to keep pushing you over to the edge until you are completely marginalized. They will never quit. That's a good lesson to know. Um, because you're right. I mean, I've been in those kind of relationships where it's, uh, there's no, there is no end. No. Just, no matter what you give them, they want more. That's more, right. more. I want more. I want more. I'm never going to be happy. I want more. Yeah. It's like they have... Um, from the jackal's perspective, I guess, is, is they have an ego that can never be satiated. That's right. right. And a very fragile ego. Yeah. You know, they can be crushed very easily. Very, very, yeah. very carefully. That's why they're always on offense and defense, always playing both sides. Because no, 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 not coming from anywhere. I'm not <coughs> going to let it in. I can't or I would die. I would shrivel and die. I would shatter and die. And that's literally the fear, right? The, the mm -hmm. fear is that extreme for them that they're not going to survive. It is. And yeah. little caveat here, they will never admit they have that fear. Because they are above and beyond all of that because they are so right, so perfect, so right on, so all encompassing. <laughs> there is not one chink in their armor. It is not possible. I, I think the way I uh, describe what you're describing is they're the type of person that comes into the room and they suck all the oxygen out of it. That's right. Right, And there's nothing left for anybody else. They leave you else. gasping and they yeah. say, what's wrong with you? Exactly. What's your problem? Yeah. Yeah. So the question then is, we know these people exist. We do. Do we seek to change them? You can change them. You can change you. And if they can change, they will change once you've changed you. And that's a huge, unfortunate thing because I know there are lots of people who are just <laughs> waiting for me to give the checklist of how to make them different. Um, but don't even try. Don't even try because when you confront a hijackal behavior or you confront a hijackal, they just come at you more. So there's never a direct assault on a hijackal. Don't bother doing it. The most important thing is for you to regroup within yourself to find out what are your values, what's your vision for your life, what are your beliefs, your beliefs about money, your beliefs about life, your beliefs about fairness, about justice, about spiritual matters, any beliefs, and what is your purposes uh, for being here. Get very, very clear about who you are and what you're up to and clean out anything that you can clean out, align things that perhaps are not quite in alignment and then come and look at the issue and say, who do I want to be in relationship to this person? So can you make a, a, a mental list, if you will, of what you're willing to give and what you're not willing to give in that situation? Because they're going to keep asking, right? Can you make a list and say, I'm, I'm willing to give X, Y, and Z, but if they ask for more, you can, can I, have your can own I private say no? list? Absolutely. And what happens then? Don't they get more aggressive or more manipulative? It depends. I put hijackals on a 1 to 10 continuum. Okay. Sometimes hijackals only come out at our very worst moments, our hijackal tendencies, when our back is fully to the wall and we just can't see any way because we've gone into, into such an arousal state or an anxiety state that our, our, our brain, our, our uh, prefrontal lobes, the centers of reason and logic and rational linear thought are not working. And so at, at those moments, their hijackalness will come out because there's no more filter. But then a 10 hijackal is like that with all people at all times. So yes, you can be very, very clear what you will, what you will allow and what you will not allow, where your boundaries are. It always starts with after you've looked at your vision, and your values, your beliefs, and your purpose, then you have to look at your boundaries because now you can set them up. And many people have very porous boundaries or non-existent boundaries or boundaries that they hold for a little while and then they relax because it's too much trouble. And that's a perfect opening for a hijackal to jump in yeah. and they're looking for it. So yeah. yes, when you do your own work, you know whether you're going to be able to allow this to happen. And if you allow that to happen, you've looked at the consequences and you're fine with it. These other things, no. 
I know very well that if I am just a little bit too much wiggle room right there, going nowhere good. I'm not going to allow that. And then you have to learn to express those boundaries. With any human being, you don't just say, well, I don't like that very much, and here's my boundary, and here's what I'm going to do about it, and too bad for you. <laughs> good, good luck with that. Now you're, now you're asking for trouble. Right? Yeah, so you've got a little bit of hijackle in you when you do that. But <clears throat> no, you, you have to tell somebody, put, give them some notice of what's going on for you. Like, all right, I've thought about this. Never talk about other people. You know, if I could give one big caveat to everybody who's listening, don't talk about other people. Don't talk about what they're doing and how they should do it and what you want from them. Talk about yourself. Here's, here's how I feel right now. Here's what I'm thinking right now. Here's what I need right mm -hmm. now. Here's what I want right now. And I wrote about that extensively in my book, Kaizen for Couples, because it's very important to be able to do that in your primary relationship. Speak from what you want or think or need or feel, not about the other person. Don't make assumptions. Don't ascribe motive. Don't do any of that. Big, big lesson. And then you will be more free to be able to say, this is okay with me, this is not okay with me. And if what's not okay with me continues to happen, this is the consequence. So we have to put people on notice to say, okay, all right with me, not all right with aren't me. Aren't you inviting when you do that? Aren't you inviting the conflict, though? Because isn't that person who needs to get more and more and you say you can have this, but oh, sure. you can't have this, that's the thing they're going to want more of? Yeah, they're going to try and push that boundary yeah. and push that boundary. And they're going to test you, right? They're going to test right. and see if you're, are you really committed to this or are you just saying it? Yeah, yeah. and they're going to make it really difficult for mm -hmm. you. But if you don't do that, you're a doormat. True. That's not really a good option for most people because you resent being a doormat. You can't help but resent being a doormat. So door number one doesn't work. So boundaries and holding boundaries and knowing you're going to be attacked you know, for those boundaries. Are you really going to hold them? Are they really going to stick? Can I push you over the edge? <laughs> you know, um, That's going to happen, <clears throat> so be ready for it. You know? Wow. Yeah, I'm, ju I'm just thinking about these, these, these kinds of relationships and it's like, yeah, you know what? You're right. I never did think about what the boundary was because my primary vision was got to make them happy, got to make sure that they're happy, make sure they're happy, make sure they're happy. And for me, it was like it didn't matter. And I was like, we talked about this earlier. Coaches are, we sort of fall into this category of give, 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 give until it hurts. I know you, you want to eliminate that from the vocabulary, and I totally agree with you. Yeah. Give until it hurts. I did that. You know, when I was working in Chicago with the Tony Robbins organization, coach until I had nothing left to coach with. I mean, I couldn't even have energy at night to eat dinner. I would come home so burnt out. Yeah. And it didn't matter. You know, at the end of the day, there was always more people needing more of you. That's right. And that's, <clears throat> that's why we have to have balance in our life. Yeah. You know, you, if you could, everybody, I remind myself of this, and I wish everybody would remind themselves of this. You cannot give a gift you do not have. That's well put. So if, I, well if put. I don't have any more energy, I can't give it to you. Yeah. And energy is like, is like cash. Okay, if I have cash, I can give it to you. If I don't have cash, I can't give it to you. Problem in our society, we have a credit card. So we get our emotional credit card and we start running on that. Now I still don't have any cash. I've got an emotional credit card. I run up the bill, there's interest. Then there's more interest. Pretty soon I'm bankrupt. Not smart. Smartest to know you cannot give a gift you do not have. Restore yourself because when you start to get out that credit card, the minute you start to get out that credit card, your resentment meter starts going up. And try as you'd like to say that you're a wonderful person with saint-like qualities and nice people don't do this and good people don't do this. Your resent meter is going up because your body, your entire self is saying, what about me? What about me? I'm, I'm running out of resources here. So we must keep balance. Well, yeah, and, and you run out of resources, and I've been there. Uh, you, you get to the point where you're completely emotionally depleted. And then the real question is, how do you recharge that? You've got to cut that relationship off. There's no other way. Otherwise, boundaries. You know, well, yeah. Boundaries. Yeah. You know, you can put boundaries into that relationship. So that would probably be the, the step before saying goodbye to the relationship would be put the boundaries there and then... Yeah. 
work from there. And to be able to speak about yourself. Right. Like not say, you know, my clients are sucking me dry. Say, no, you know, I'm giving too much of my time mm -hmm. and energy in a place that doesn't allow me to restore. So instead of five take, clients a day, let's go down to three and see how that works. Yeah, instance. let's take the ownership for the fact I'm giving away that energy. Right. That's free will. You know, nobody's, nobody's making me mm -hmm. do that, right? So let's take back our, our energy scorecard and, and get the balance back in and say, all right, I allowed myself to get to the place of burnout. I can now dial back. And here's what I'm going to do. And you can take ownership for that. Again, talk about yourself, not about other people. This is good, really, really good advice. I think you're helping a lot of people. Actually, you're, you're seeing that, too, in your own practice, because I know you're sort of on this trajectory now of being even more in demand than you've ever been, because they get the words getting out about this, and it's people true. are resonating, and they're going, wait a minute, yeah, I know those kinds of people. Yeah, and because of the wonderful world that we live in, I have clients all over the world, because I use Zoom, and I can be in a room with people in anywhere in the world, I can have one, one part of a couple in New York and the other part in Dallas, and the three of us are on the line and speaking as though we're in one place. Wow. So I don't believe in counseling when I can't see people. I don't believe in, in doing that work. I must be able to see them, see them in space, see their body, see their eye contact, mm -hmm. see the, all of that. But we live in this am amazing digital world where that can happen. So I can give class and I can, I can do one-on-one -on -one work with anybody anywhere, which is wonderful. And yes, it is, it is really growing because I'm shining a light on something that you have been taught not to see. When you've been with a hijackal, you've been culled from the herd and you've been fed certain things and that doesn't include anything that's wrong with the hijackal. <laughs> <laughs> and when you go to your friends, they're tired of your story. They're tired of telling you, you know, leave that person, walk out of that relationship, give up that contract. And when you don't do it, you come, oh yes, but, and it'll only be a little longer and I know that he or she is having problems. They don't want to hear that anymore. They're tired of hearing from you. So you get further cult from the herd. And now, because I have a closed Facebook group called Surviving Hijackals, I have a newsletter that people can get. You can get my free ebook called How to Spot a Hijackal by going to hijackals.com. And, and I'm sure that you have it on a screen somewhere, but for people who don't know how to spell hijackals, because I found it's there are many ways. It's on the screen ways. right there, forrelationshiphelp.com. Yes, you can go to forrelationshiphelp.com, <laughs> but you can also go to hijackals.com if you want to get immediately to sign up and get the free ebook, How to Spot a Hijackal. Oh, great. Because if you think great. you're with one right now, you need a quick check. Also, if you think you're with someone who's passive aggressive, I have a free online checklist. Go to passive aggressive checklist or just passive passive dot aggressive dot net, passive dash aggressive dot net, and you'll see the free checklist there. And what it does is it helps you delineate are these the things I'm seeing? You take the checklist with a person in mind. And then when you finish the first part, if your score was sufficient that you're absolutely with somebody who is passive aggressive, there's a part two that helps you move on and clarify. Hmm. And that's free at passiveaggressive.net. You've got a lot of domains. <laughs> Actually, I I'm it. so proud of myself. I've gone from 380 domains down to 240. I'm just thrilled with my... I'm still at about 150, so you're way <laughs> ahead of me, which is great. <laughs> I well, thought I was doing bad. No, well, I, I'm getting better. <clears throat> I'm, I'm reducing. I'm reducing. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'm just going to say goodbye to our Facebook Live audience. Thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, Roberta and I are going to continue our conversation offline. And uh, we're going to put this video up in its entirety on themarketingnetwork.tv. I put the little domain up there, themarketingnetwork.tv. If you go there, you'll be able to sign up as a member and you're going to get this interview in, in its entirety, plus so many more. So um, I leave you with that and uh, we're just going to say goodbye to you right now, but we're going to continue our conversation. Great. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you soon.